This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. If you're enjoying the show, please show your support by heading over to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and leave us a review. Thank you, and enjoy this week's episode. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Catherine and I have two very special guests, Anya Bauermeister and Christina Love. <laughs> I'm having trouble with that name. Uh, <laughs> so Anya and Christina are translators. They translate books from English to German. And Anya, you also do some work with marketing in the German marketplace for authors. And you two have a partnership as translators. And in fact, you translated my book, A Stone's Throw, into Ein Einziger Steinwerf. All right. Am I slaughtering German <laughs> pronunciation That's here? That's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, why don't we start by you two telling us a little bit about <clears throat> yourselves um, as writers, as translators, just kind of anything you would like us to know. We'll start with that. Go Anya. ahead, Christina. Oh, we'll start with Christina. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, probably I'm starting. Um, what to say? Well, I'm a translator in books well starting with your book Alida so this was our first project together um, and well my other capacity I'm right, right now I'm doing my PhD in art history and I'm working as a journalist um, I'm working in um, well in radio as well as print and, print and online so I'm doing a lot of things with writing and working a little bit on my own picture projects but I haven't uh, yet published them, so it's just, just in my closet for now. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that you work with um, fiction as well as journalism. So obviously you're both, Sonia is a writer as well, you both understand the process of writing a book and all of the effort that goes into that. So Anya, why don't you give us your introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, Anja Bauermeister and I am a translator, a writer. Uh, I used to be a scientist, but I kind of quit with that career path about a year ago to become a freelance translator and writer. Uh, I'm working with Alida as my writing coach on an English novel that I'm writing, which is still in progress. But I'm also writing German novels, and I've published my first one last March, which is a young adult novel. And not really young adult, it's a story for young people. It's not really fitting in the genre of young adults because it's um, a historical novel um, based on the experiences of my grandpa in the Second World War when he was 16. So that's what I do. And the translation business, you know, Christina is my partner in it and I also run the website Indies Go German which is a blog where I give free information for authors who want to publish in Germany and don't know how to market their books in a foreign language. Mm, fantastic. So since we focus mainly on craft and not on marketing on this show, um, let's talk a little bit about just being bilingual or even maybe you have three or four or five languages. <laughs> I know some Europeans do, but in America, that that's so amazing to us, I think, because foreign languages aren't even taught until junior yeah. high if you go to a normal public school. And so learning a language to the point of fluency is quite a challenge. So let's start with just the... The fact that you speak multiple languages and how that factors into what you do. I mean, obviously, it's a prerequisite for being a translator, but I think it's fascinating. <laughs> Anytime I meet people fluent in another language, I'm awestruck, 
right? <laughs> yeah. Christy, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, well, good question. Um, I have to admit, um, for me, well, I'm, I wouldn't really say I'm fluent in English. It's just that I, I've watched so many TV shows, actually, in English. Um, my husband and I, we're just sometimes we're, we're talking and joking in English just because we like to. Um, but it's mostly, it just happened that I got more, more and more interested to um, read things in English, to watch uh, stuff, to correspond with people who are not fluent in German. So, well, if you do not speak German, you have to um, get better at English. And in mm -hmm. my, um, when I was at the university as well, and I had a couple of, um, well, summer schools where I was, for example, in Finland. And, well, I do not speak Finnish, but, well, everyone spoke English. So mm -hmm. English, it's just the language to, to speak. So it was rather, it wasn't really a choice. It was more like it's, you, you, you're used to do it. So, well, but English is my main other language than German. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. And Anya, you actually lived in the United States for a while. Yeah, I started um, when I was young. I started when I was 16 and I came to the U.S. for a high school exchange year. That was 10 months. And when you're young, you're much quicker at picking up a language, especially in, when you live there. So that mm -hmm. was my start into it. And from then on, I think I have been pretty fluent in English. And I've lived in the U.S. again for one and a half years um, just before I started my business as a postdoc. So, yeah, I think that hmm. I'm I'm not native level, I don't think, but I mean, I realize when I write that it's not native level. It's not the <laughs> same as when I write in German, but I can um, definitely tell the difference between, I don't know, probably dialects or accents mm -hmm. or something that you really need to develop an ear for uh, and that only comes after a while, so... Right. Well, okay. I would like to know more about how living in the U.S. has affected your grasp of English and how that factors into your your work as a translator. But also, you're taking stories written in English, presumably by native English speakers. So we've got that ground covered in your native German speakers. So um, then I would like both of you to kind of address that process of translation and what's happening for you um, creatively and technically as you go through that process. So first, Anya, can you say something about how living in the U.S. has affected your grasp of English? Or Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, I think, yeah, that, that I can, because of that, I can pick up the nuances of words of of meanings basically which is very important for translations mm -hmm. because in liter uh, in literature you want to not only translate the text the words that are there you want to know the that the style the the voice of the author all of that is transferred into the other language and for that you definitely have to be fluent and i don't know living in a country just you communicate in English all the time. You mm -hmm. hear people speaking English. You're immersed in it. So it's difficult not to get fluent in it. Although, yeah, maybe some people, I know some people who have been living in foreign countries and have managed not to learn the <laughs> language. <laughs> so it depends. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, for the translation, it's for me, it's very helpful that I have been in the U.S. And I don't think I would have just, even had the idea if that hadn't been the case and I you know for the writing as well if I write um, sometimes the words come out in German and sometimes in English it's like I have become mm. bilingual in a way because I'm also listening like Christina listening watching reading in English all the time so thinking in English is just normal for me and speaking to my boyfriend in English too sometimes yeah <laughs> <laughs> funny isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is yeah. funny and I'm, I'm a little bit envious I've always wanted to speak another language and I've studied several over the years but if you don't have the framework for that immersion if you don't have someone to practice with or some you know it just it disappears it vanishes so quickly so 
I yeah, think you know, it's so cool. Yeah, you know, you should, should uh, do that more. Um, mm -hmm. You should go more on vacations outside of the English-speaking world, so <laughs> maybe. I know that there are not a lot of high school exchange people that come from the U.S. to Germany, for instance. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if they do, it's for a few weeks or a month. It's not, mm. not for a full year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does... um. Tell us, walk us through the process that you go through when you look at a manuscript and what it's like to take a text from English to German. Christina? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking about it because, well, if you would have asked me, I think about one and a half years ago, I could have Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com. And of course, I have to go over it again to make it polished, to well, make it readable. Mm -hmm. But the, the grasp, it's really fast because I'm so used to reading in English. So um, for me, it's difficult to describe the process, I have to admit. How is it for you, Anja? No, that's, yeah, that's the process. For me, it's also the first draft translation where I just go through the text the first time. I don't even read it beforehand because A, it will take too long. And B, it's much more fun if I don't even know what's going to happen. So it's like I'm reading the book and writing it at the same time is what I always mm. say. So, <laughs> and yeah. Um, Yeah, so the story is already there, which is for me the hardest part about writing mm -hmm. right now because I'm not yet very good at storycraft or not experienced enough. And writing itself is, is kind of natural for me. So I know, I don't know, I just have an act for it. And therefore, you just have to kind of put the words into the other word, into the other language. And then um, I go over it again, like Christina said, to polish it to make sure that it sounds like something that would have been written in German and not like something that has been translated, mm -hmm. which often means changing the sentence structure most of the time, actually, because I must say that a lot of writers like to use these forms with the ing ending, and uh -huh. we just do <laughs> not have a way to say yes. that in German. <laughs> Huh. You always have to say something. Like, for example, um, picking up her shirt, she ran out of the house. You cannot write it. You have to say, as she picked up her shirt, she ran out of the house. So it becomes a completely different sentence. And then a lot of writers have the tendency. I'm sorry, I'm not complaining. I'm just noticing. <laughs> no, that's so interesting. <laughs> have, uh, to put a lot of these um, sentence uh, clauses, uh, you know, one at the end, uh, it becomes such a long compound sentence. And You know, when you do that in German, it becomes mm -hmm. unreadable and you have to just cut it and make different, yeah, segments and that's of another, it. So. And, and, wow. uh, <laughs> that's another reason because why, um, well, if you translate a book from English to German, it always gets bigger. <laughs> because <laughs> you, cannot, uh, re uh, you cannot write it that short. So, yeah. Well, You have the example there. Yeah, you can see oh. that the translation is thicker than the English version. So the yeah. English, the English is 259 pages, and the German is 310. Yeah, I think it can become like 10,000 words more for that kind of length of novel. So um, it's, yeah, it's, It's weird because German has a lot of long compound words where we put words together mm -hmm. that you don't write together. But still, because you have a sentence or you have grammar that is, I think, a little easier, um, a little, mm. yeah, just it cuts out more words in between. We cannot cut out these words. So, for example, you can cut out a that from a sentence completely because mm -hmm. it's just implied. We cannot do that. So, yeah, it just always adds words. <laughs> Interesting. So when you are, you can read and watch shows and think and have conversations in English. So can you turn your translator mind on and off? You know how writers say, oh, now that I'm writing, I can't read a book for pleasure. I'm always reading it for analysis. So if, can you just read a book in English 
and just enjoy it and digest it? Or are you always switching it into German as you read now that you're doing that translation process? Not at all, no. We just read in English, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so when you sit yeah, down to translate, be... you have to consciously say, okay, now I'm I'm doing mm -hmm. this this work. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. I mean, <laughs> requires a lot of brain um, work, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's right. not natural. <laughs> Because yeah. when you really know language, you don't have to translate it in, in your head anymore. So. Mm -hmm. I think what's yeah. always... Interesting because uh, I just uh, remembered as you were referring to the ing ending. It's interesting to figure out if you know a phrase, but it just doesn't exist in the other language. Mm. Um, so you have to um, to look: is there a phrase similar to it in the meaning, or mm -hmm. do you have to describe it, or well, figure out a way how to say it without saying it? So this is. Mm. Sometimes it's really fun. Sometimes it's like, oh my god, I have to wreck my brain around it, and I'm just not getting there. Yeah, <laughs> and that's where collaboration is really a good yes. way because you can, you know, converse with the other translator or your editor, and they can give you some hints that you might have overlooked. And also, it's very important to have someone else read through it because as a translator, you when you translate something, it's like when you're writing it, you mm -hmm. sometimes don't see anymore that it just sounds weird because you know what it was like in English in the original and you just like, oh yeah, that's okay. And then somebody else reads it and like, no, we wouldn't say that like that in German. <laughs> so very important. Mm -hmm. So do you use like a beta reader process before you turn a manuscript back to, or turn it in and say it's finished? We are just use each other. So we are okay. giving it back and forth between ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we had beta readers for your book, so that was different, but not for most of the other books. Right, right. Catherine, yeah. I've been asking all the questions here. I'm hogging no, the mic today. No, this is great. I just, I love hearing how it's almost, almost like a co-writer relationship. Like it feels like, like you have that creative power over that translation that's really awesome like being able to translate because you're really mm -hmm. translating not just words but meanings mm -hmm. and that's awesome to me I just think that's fascinating <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah I do too especially since these languages are so different from each other like the compound words you were talking about and even the German just looks so strange to me because you capitalize all the nouns. So I look at a page and I'm like, what? <laughs> there aren't right. that many names in the, in the story. You know, yeah. you have to kind of get used to that. Right. So how would you characterize the difference between English and German? I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but what's kind of the the main difference or is there a way you can describe that for us? <laughs> German can, difficult German can be a very formal language I think and very poetic as well mm -hmm. if you um, use all of these nice verbs that we have um, English is for me more of an emotional language I don't know mm -hmm. I just feel like I can express myself better in English if I want to say how I feel and I do not know why that is I really don't maybe That's it's interesting English American people do do that more than Germans I mean we mm -hmm. you know we have a stereotype of the stiff or you know stiff Germans and maybe that's true maybe it's the language <laughs> who knows <laughs> right well I think that um there is a very deep connection between the language we speak and our syntax and the culture I know there have been uh, studies recently I'm not sure if they're linguistic or anthropological or scientific but um, I've seen things that talk about how in Asian languages like Chinese they don't have a future tense so if you say you're going to the store tomorrow you say I'm going to the store and it just is mm -hmm. and that really shapes kind of their view point their world view about your past and your future and how you manage your life around that. And, you know, if you think of 
kind of the stereotype of the German culture, you're going to think technical innovation and, you know, structure and formality and those kinds of things. And if you look at English speaking Mm -hmm. cultures, um, we're probably a lot softer, like, (laughs) you know, going in more directions, kind of, I don't know, I'm going to offend my fellow English speakers here. But when you were talking about emotion, I thought of the romantic poets first. I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know. Hmm. What do you think, Christina? I was just thinking about another example about uh, regarding formality, because, um, well, when we translate, for example, it's in modern uh, fiction, it's more relaxed, but um, especially in historic fiction, we're always figuring out, well, is it formal or informal? Of course, in English, it looks the same. It, well, sometimes you can see it with a title, of course. Then you know if they are formal or informal with each other. With each other. But in German, you do have a different phrasing. So, for example, if there's, um, I don't know, uh, a page and a lord, they wouldn't, in English, they would say you. But in German, for example, um, if the Lord were talking down to the page, he would, for example, say do, which would be informal. But mm-hmm. the page on the other way around, um, well, in historic fiction, he would say, Euer Lord, Euer Lordschaft, for example, so it's your highness. Um, so it's really difficult to figure out um, how to translate, and this always um, relies on close, close, close communication with the author. So we're always mm-hmm. like, what do you mean? How do these uh, two characters uh, relate to each other? Um, do they get to know each other over the um, period of the book? So, mm-hmm. for example, at first they do not know each other. It's quite informal. And later on they get closer and then it's more informal. Yeah, and we have to show it in the German language. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Z in the old English language. Mm-hmm. So you had the Z and the thou, right? So Right. That one was formal and one was informal. So we still have that and we have to decide which one to use. Yeah. So even in today, if you meet a stranger, would you use formal language just to show that emotional distance and respect? And then when you become friends, use the informal? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Pronouns. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's so cool. Yeah. With English historical fiction, I just printed out a copy of my Victorian novel. (laughs) It's moving to the front burner. (laughs) Um, And, you know, in English, I really pay attention to contractions, and I'm careful not to use too many in the historical fiction. And then the syntax is more formal, just the way people speak, and even the narrative has to be different than in my contemporary fiction in order to reflect that historical period. So it's just an interesting, um, interesting piece you brought up about the difference in period and formality and relationships between people. And yeah. 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 And contractions also, again, make the language shorter in your, uh, Mm -hmm. in English. So all of that is a separate word. He'd is he had, you can't say it any other way. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Makes all the sentences longer and bloaty mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you have any questions, Catherine? <laughs> Actually, I do. I was um, on that cultural bit. Um, when you're translating something and you're talking about how um, you make it sound right in German, is that also like something that with idioms or cultural touchstones and things, do you try to translate those over into things that the German readers would understand differently than maybe, say, an English reader would? Um, idioms, definitely. Like Christina mentioned it with the phrasing, you know, with if you have something like bite the bullet, we would say um, he bit into the sour apple, I think. That's the mm-hmm. German equivalent for it. Interesting. Yeah. Really? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and those b- are fun. Biting into a them. sour apple means the same thing as biting the bullet? I think so. 
<laughs> it means that you are um, taking on something that you don't really want. Okay, biting the bullet can also mean dying, right? I don't know, but it it's um, yeah, or con that's contextually, yeah. I guess. Definitely, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was if, you know during like the civil war when like they didn't really have anesthesia in the field and guys were getting amputations or whatever done, they would give them a bullet to bite. And these oh. bullets, they would flatten them because of the pain. They would clench down so hard, these bullets would come out completely flat. And then if the guy didn't die from his war wounds or the resulting infections, he often died from lead poisonings. The, the <laughs> you know, the uh, ammunition was made yeah. out of lead. <laughs> So basically, so. it's the lesser of the two evils that you are taking, not the lesser, but you're basically getting something bad for not taking something worse, right? Mm -hmm. mm. I know. I when know. I say bite the bullet, I think like, <laughs> oh, I'm just going to get it done. Like, I don't right. want to go do this thing, but I'm just going to bite the bullet and get through it. Like, grit your teeth and get through yeah, it kind no, of that's, a yeah. meaning. Yeah, that's what you can say with biting into the sour apple. Okay. So, yeah, that is okay. the same meaning, basically. Huh. Yeah. What mm -hmm. about, like, cultural differences and things that, that just aren't in your culture that are in English culture that may be in, like, contemporary fiction? Yeah, that's difficult. Like, for example, mm -hmm. anything that is related to pop fiction. Uh, pop, is that what you say? Pop culture, sorry? Pop yeah. culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, if I I am trying to determine whether Germans in general would know that. If it's like something like Star Trek, sure, everybody knows it. But if it's something very, you know, like a cook on a TV show that we never have seen here, then I would probably try to take another, an equivalent, like from a German <laughs> cooking show or something. Mm, yeah. But if the, if the story is set in the United States or England mm. or wherever, so that... Like, so that the characters, you know, Don't they know would have, right. yeah, they would have the English mm -hmm. reference, not the German reference, then wouldn't the German readers just be like, whatever, it's a guy on TV, you know, or would you? Yeah, but then I would have to explain it at least, because if you just say yeah. the name, it doesn't mean anything. So I would say, like the cook on the TV show, blah, blah, blah. So sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. What is your... um your attitude or your your approach someone gives you a book and they can't read german so it's all in your hands and there's this great act of faith that you're going to be true to that book but i think also listening to this conversation there's going to be your fingerprint on it as well now because of the act of translation. It's not a word for word transcription. It's, it's this whole other stage of evolution for the story. So can you talk a little bit about your attitude and your approach in that regard? I think, well, it's mostly to, as Anya already said earlier, trying to, um, well, get the language, get the style of the book, get the um, the voice of the author into the other language. Mm -hmm. To be true to this voice, but of course to change something that um, readers, for example, in Germany just wouldn't get. And of course to change the wording sometimes, to change um, the sent sentence structure, but mostly trying to stay close to the meaning, of course, to stay close to how the author is um, mm -hmm. well, telling the story, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you definitely notice the differences between our translations of a historical um, novel or romance and a te contemporary novel, because mm -hmm. we obviously try to make that difference visible as well, and it's a completely different style and language. Wow. Yeah, and... Yeah, that's great. And, and if we just... don't know something, we'll ask the author. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I wanted Sorry. to make sure people got to hear that too. That mm -hmm. when you take a work and you translate it, it's really a process of honoring the original. Right. You know, as well as making it this thing fit for a new audience in a totally different language and such. Mm -hmm. So, what and if the you. Title. The, oh. Yes. The title is part of that as well, to <laughs> make the title part of that different 
language and that's a, yeah but we can talk about that later if you wanted to say something else no go ahead let's talk about the title a bit that's interesting because my german title is not a stone's throw what does that mean it is it means a a single stone's throw so it's similar okay yeah it just has this other word in it because mostly we had the problem with the title protection issue in German, we have a law that says you cannot use the title of a book that has already been published. And a lot of books had the name of a stone's throw, not a lot. Uh, one <laughs> had the book of a stone's throw and others had similar titles. So mm -hmm. we had to work around that. We're still trying to make it sound good as well as make it um, mean something that is related to the book. Mm -hmm. And that is also why we changed the cover in the German version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the literal translation of Ein Einziger Steinwerf? And tell me if I'm mispronouncing that, because no, I don't know. Good. <laughs> a so, single stone's throw. Okay. Yeah, single. So a single so, stone's throw. So we hmm. were thinking in the terms of if you throw one stone into the water and it becomes, you know, waves and it just expands everywhere which mm -hmm. is what you said you meant with the title. So that mm -hmm. can still mean that. Right, right, good. I remember the email exchanges we had <laughs> oh, when yes. you were <laughs> suggesting various titles and giving me the translations, and we were talking mm. about this this process, which is interesting. It was something I hadn't thought of when mm -hmm. we started the translation. I didn't know that the title would have to be changed, and I suppose some titles, even if they aren't taken in German, the translation might just not mm. work because of mm. word choice or syntax or cultural references as well. Mm. So yeah, yeah, exactly. And mm. you might change them on um, deliberately because uh, maybe German women's titles have a, a certain style to them that you would want to imitate and then you would make it sound like them instead of trying to stick to the English version because you always want to attract the right readers. So mm -hmm. that makes sense for the title. Right. Definitely. Cool. Do you have any other questions, Catherine? Or I comments? <laughs> Thoughts? <laughs> anything? No, it's awesome. It is. It's so fascinating. So one final question is what have you two learned as just yourselves, creative people, writers, what is this process of translation and doing it repeatedly over the years brought to you? For me, well, a lot of English. <laughs> so uh -huh. um, when, when we took on um, the first project, at first it was a little bit, can I really do this? But I really, well, put my mind to it. We both did. And, um, well, I think with every, with every book, I learn more. I learn more about language uh, in the total sense. I learn more about German because I have to figure out how to um, phrase um, different stories in German. Mm -hmm. I learn more about English. So it's, and as well, I do like all the different stories. So for me, it's a, not only a fountain of ideas for my own uh, adventures <laughs> into literature, but I just, I love to read. So every mm -hmm. new story, it's, it's just a new adventure. So not only the work, the translation, but it's the joy of the stories as well. So mm -hmm. to dive into and to get to know the author behind the book, because sometimes after a couple of books, well, at least you think to know a little bit about about the author, so <laughs> her or his style, and um, yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, just so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would add to that also the for me it brought the editing and proofreading skills <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, I had to develop for myself and for um, somebody else and. That also helps me in my own writing because, well, maybe it helps me, maybe it doesn't in a way <laughs> because my <laughs> internal editor is always on. <laughs> so mm -hmm. sometimes it's difficult, but, um, right. yeah, I, I think I would, I would say that I've become a better writer because I am translating stuff from other writers. And that means you are really taking a really close look at, uh, something that has been written. It's, 
um, translating is even, I think, a closer look than editing, I think, maybe. Because, I yeah. Think <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just take every word apart, basically. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find you? Do you have websites or links you would like to share with our audience? My website is at indiesgogerman.com and you can just find any kind of information about German market and translations if you want to find a translator. And um, I currently am pretty much booked out with translations, so mm -hmm. I cannot accept any new clients, but that might change in the near future or in the far future. <laughs> <laughs> right, but people can still go to your website to learn about oh, you awesome. and marketing, entering the German marketplace. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have a website, Christina? Yes, for me. Well, for the English audience, it's probably a little bit hard because it's my name. So. That's all right. We will we will put the links in the show notes. So, <laughs> so it's uh, Christina Löw from uh, dot de. So, well, the last thing for Germany. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of information about myself. Um, my um, translations is there, and. As well, I'm really booked out right now, but nevertheless, um, I'm always interested to meet new authors, to get to know new words. And well, although if I'm not always um, on the market for new translations, um, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to connect um, to other translators, to other proofreaders. And if it's a short novel, I might even be um, able to fit at least a proofreading in so <laughs> always <good> yeah <laughs> and I would um, say that we would also or I would help with if you want to translate or have your novel translated then and you're looking for a translator and you're not sure if it's a good one because you don't speak German then we can have a look at the sample translation if it's not too long like 500 words and I think you can already tell from a short sample that whether it's a good thing or not, uh, whether it's a good translation or not. Wonderful. Well, so. thank you so much. And we will put all the necessary details and links to your websites in the show notes at wordessential.com slash storyworks roundtable. Thank you for listening to the Storyworks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.